So it's great to introduce our next speaker, Hannah Malcolm. Uh, Hannah is an ordinand in the Church of England and is a PhD candidate at the University of Durham. Her research focuses on a theology of climate, of a climate and ecological grief. She edited the 2020 SEM Press book entitled Words for a Dying World, Stories of Grief and Courage from the Global South, which we heard about in one of our main sessions earlier. And so it's great to hand over to Hannah now as she presents a paper entitled The Shared Art of Attention to Place. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, for being here for this graveyard slot of the conference. It's um, lovely to, to share with you some of these reflections. Um, for the last few years, um, as was mentioned, I've been working on um, some thought around um, how we might speak about loss um, in communities. Um, and more recently, in the last year or so, I've become quite actively involved in thinking around um, what we do with church land and in particular um, the land owned by the Church of England because um, that's my denomination. So this paper, um, I suppose, comes out of some of those reflections a little bit and tries to give um, a scope for how we might think better about place as we do that work. So in the 1970s, a geographer called Yifu Tuan distinguished space from place. Space, he claimed, simply denotes physical environment, while places are imbued with narrated and imagined meanings, particularly over the passing of time. Place then is a kind of attention. Place is made through speaking about space together. Since Tuan's observation, the rise in displaced experiences from short-term work contracts, increasing migration and anti-migrant politics, the growth of the online world, the ecological crisis or homogenized city spaces shaped by finance capitalism, all of these have led to renewed interest in the meaning of place. Some examples, philosopher Lorraine Code proposes that placemaking also includes non-human creatures. Sociologist Thomas Kieran argues that space becomes place only when it ensconces history or utopia, danger or security, identity or memory. And he says it's malleable over time and inevitably contested. More recently, environmental scientists have turned to the significance of place for sustainability. In a place-themed issue of environmental science and policy, F. Stuart Chapin and Corin Knapp focus on place as potentially motivating parochialism and exclusion as people derive different meanings from the same local space. Place can end up becoming a symbol rather than a set of active relationships. That is, the idea of a place becomes static if it's not attended to in speech together. But despite renewed interest in place, theological attention has been tepid. Placed theology is primarily concerned with the significance of the parish or nature spirituality, often drawing on the Celtic tradition or the Desert Fathers, or perhaps nostalgia for rural community, often drawing on Wendell Berry. Two notable exceptions are John Inger's A Christian Theology of Place, which reignites the tradition of holy places, and Mike, Michael Northcott's Place, Ecology and the Sacred, which explores the sacred as anchoring local ecology. Political theology has also somewhat considered contested places, for example, Anthony Reddy's Theologizing Brexit and Oliver O'Donovan's The Ways of Judgment, which defines place as the social communication of space. So I want to specifically examine in this time what communication about a place does and how speech about places can nurture compassionate attention. If shared speech makes place, then privatized attention to place, that is where one narrative dominates, has consequences. One example is romanticized nature writing, focusing on personal and often temporary experience without reference to local communities or histories. Another is the literal privatization of shared space through buying common land in order to render it a financial asset. One example is in the image on the screen here, the C City Hall London, which sits entirely on a private estate owned by a Kuwaiti investment company. So those who wish to protest decisions made at P City Hall by the government require corporate permission to gather. Both of these, romanticized nature writing and literal privatization, represent a failure to pay proper attention to the nature of places. If place represents a relational context, full attentiveness to it must be shared. So I'll turn now to two potential approaches to place making, the art of naming other creatures and the art of public prayer. The loss of shared knowledge about creaturely names came to public attention in 2015, when a group of authors published a letter to the Oxford Junior Dictionary about their decision to quietly drop a number of creature words, including the ones you see here. I'm going to read some of them out to you now. 
acorn, blackberry, bluebell, clover, dandelion, fern, hazelnut, heron, kingfisher, lavender, magpie, mussel, otter, pansy, poppy, primrose, starling, stalk, tulip, weasel, willow, wren. The Oxford Junior Dictionary's response that their dictionaries are designed to reflect language as it is used reflects an ideology which treats speech about the world as a neutral or organic reflection of existing attention rather than a creative activity which makes attention itself. Robert McFarlane, one of the authors that um, drew attention to this drop in these words, summarized this problem in his comment on their justification. We do not care for what we do not know. And on the whole, we do not know what we cannot name. In response, he and Jackie Morris produced The Lost Words, a book concerned with directing the gaze, as they put it, designed to restore to children lost language about the world in order that restored relationship would follow. Public attention has not only turned to words for creatures we've lost, but also our lack of words for the experience of lost ecological stability and intimacy. Zadie Smith's essay, Elegy for a Country Seasons, voices our lack of proficiency in the art of naming loss. She says, there is the scientific and ideological language for what is happening to the weather, but there are hardly any intimate words. It is not incidental that Robert McFarlane, Jackie Morris and Zadie Smith are artists crafting words and images in order to shape our attention. Anthropologist James Weiner goes further in identifying the naming with making place. He writes, language and place are a unity. Human action inscribes itself upon the earth as an iconography of human intentions. Its mirror image is speech itself, which in the act of naming memorializes these intentions, makes of them a history in dialogue. So losing shared names represents losing shared place, both a result of the loss and also by furthering alienation. Passing on creaturely names and local ecologies invites us to speak together about those places, to participate in storytelling, which tells us how we belong and who belongs. And naming, of course, also has theological significance. In the Ark of Speech, Catholic phenomenologist Jean-Louis Chrétien interprets the Genesis account of creature naming as hospitality to other creatures. While naming alone does not make us hospitable, we might think, for example, of categorizing creatures in order to better manage them. Hospitality for Chrétien depends on this first welcome of naming. In passing on shared names, we make creaturely community possible. Simply knowing the words for creatures does not equal intimate knowledge or attentiveness, but the words, the signs, remind us to look. They teach attention. We can be informed by Augustine's approach to speech as teaching. In De Magistro, Augustine describes the end of speaking as teaching. Even speech about learning is teaching. When we ask questions, we communicate to another what it is we want to know. In this, Augustine is teaching speech as exterior, involving signs which point to the existence of things. Things, of course, transcend the signs we give them. Our words are always inadequate descriptions of our environments, but they are necessary for attention because they tell us where to look. Our sense of place, then, will in large part be made of signs, telling us which things around us are relationally significant. By speaking the names of other creatures, and especially local names, we participate in place making. Creaturely names demonstrate the power of shared speech, but they do rely on a certain consensus of experience. So while not everyone might see the value of learning local creature names, there is at least usually consensus about what names they should be given. Though it's also worth noting that imposing language can itself be a way of homogenizing a place for the purpose of power. And political opposition to colonial dominance often includes resistance to language eradication. As a local example, we might think of the resistance to wiping out Welsh, Irish, and other Gaelic languages. But as we hold that kind of naming process in one part of this talk, I want to now consider how shared speech can also incorporate some of these more divergent or perhaps conflicting experience of place. And to do so, I turn to public prayer that is spoken prayer with others in a publicly accessible place. Public prayer is responsive to contextual changes and it is able to redirect attention to local narratives which might otherwise go unheard or dismissed. <clears throat> so to do this, I want to return to Jean-Louis Chrétien 
with a focus now on his description of prayer as a choral act. While all speech, even between two people, takes place in a wider community and history, prayer is particularly a response to theophany, that is, we speak because we have already heard the speech of God in the world. Prayer for Kratien emerges from the vulnerability and contingency of our praise and petition, accompanied by realizing our individual inability to pray fully or well. Prayer modifies the one who prays. And he says this prayer should be externalized, acknowledging that we do not speak alone. We always speak in response, both to the call of God and the call of the world. His emphasis on belonging to the world as necessary for prayer offers a helpful starting point for considering how prayer together might make collective attention to place. So when we gather in our worshiping communities and we publicly intercede for a place, we direct our collective attention to aspects of a place perceived as in need of divine compassion. So we might, for example, pray for those who are vulnerable, who are marginal, who are grieving, who are downhearted, who are lonely. In doing so, we speak desires about the place we live and trust our actions will be more aligned with these desires. But our desires can be divergent, so public prayer also often includes local prayer requests, given collective attention by speaking them out loud. These prayer requests often may not reflect the dominant narratives of a place, given that they usually rely on the admission of vulnerability. But in naming them, the community is given signs which direct attention to needs or desires of which they may not have been aware. This motivates belonging to a place as it really is, rather than as we imagine it to be. By contrast, of course, we could gather in our worshiping communities for public prayer, which avoids specificity, refuses to voice requests, or focuses only on the inner life of the church. And this will have the inverse effect. The worshiping community becomes further alienated from its placed reality. This art of developing speech about place and redirecting divergent attention towards the marginalized is necessarily political. In The Promise of Politics, Hannah Arendt described what is required for proper attention towards the world. If someone wants to see and experience the world as it really is, they can do so only by understanding it as something that is shared by many people, showing itself differently to each and comprehensible only to the extent that many people can talk about it over against one another. It is speech together which teaches us about the world. And if this disappears, so does a full sense of our place in the world. Elsewhere, Arendt stresses the related affinity between politics and the performing arts. Our speech together is a performed story which constantly makes and remakes our attention. The point here is that it is not just that we have words to speak together which matters, but also it matters what kinds of words we speak about the world. We can see this in effect, for example, in the stories we weave around land owned by the church, land which I believe is in desperate need of our collective reimagination. In my own denomination, the Church of England, this is true at both an institutional and a local level, whether it is in the dominant language of asset management and fiduciary duty or of, of our national investment investing bodies or in the sterility of a neat and tidy churchyard, which offers one of the only green spaces for a local community. And as I've indicated in relation to creaturely names, it is also reflected in the stories we are unable to tell because we do not have the words for them because we simply do not know about the creatures, the habitats and the beauty for which we are responsible. We are only now in the process of mapping the well over 100,000 acres owned by the church commissioners. And we have a great deal of learning to do about the communities of creatures which have come under our care and which have up until now fallen out of our field of vision. So before we open up the virtual room for some conversation, I want to close by briefly introducing the practice of climate and ecological grief as one which has the potential to open us up to properly shared speech if we let it. Just as speech about the places we share cannot be private if it is to be full or true speech, equally speech about experiences of climate and ecological loss cannot be privatized if they are to be true. And this was my experience in editing Words for a Dying World. The proper expression of loss will require us to both have shared language for our loss, knowledge of the names for things that are slipping through our fingers, and also attentiveness to these creatures in our shared public prayer, where we will learn to see them as God does, as beloved, as worthy of protection, as a community to which we belong. To return to Zadie Smith's observation, there is the scientific and ideological language for what is happening to the weather, but there are hardly any intimate words. We will need to learn this language, this intimate language of loss, 
And for my country in context, it sounds like the words that you see before you hear. But we must also bring this language of loss before God. To be clear, this is not because creation cannot speak its own loss to God. We return a final time to the writing of Jean-Louis Chrétien, who accords speech to creatures independent of human existence. If speech emerges from listening to God, who is first to speak and to whom all respond, other creatures also hear and respond to divine speech and have done so before humans. As he puts it, we cannot sing the world unless the world itself sings already. We are never the first to listen or the first to offer, ho offer hospitality. Nevertheless, we must bring this loss before God in lament because it is our loss, both as perpetrators of the loss and as praying creatures whose capacity to belong to the world is diminished by our own sin. In our prayer, we must be constantly reconfigured and reoriented by the other speech we hear, both human and non-human. Our prayer is not privatized, but choral, and these calls will not be solely harmonious. Prayerful expression of creatureliness insists that we hold both our desire to speak together about the world as a whole, and also accept the disruptive diversity of voices and experiences whose call we received, according to their attentiveness to their place. For example, while in much of the minority world, ecological breakdown has led to growing romantic framing of non-human creatures. In many other parts of the world, the non-human has become increasingly threatening, whether through extreme weather events or growing disease and food insecurity. Our losses then are shaped by the places we belong. We do not grieve loss evenly or consistently, but in prayer, our speech about the world can become even a discordant song, trusting our divergent experiences to the one who first gives us the desire to speak of them. So when we speak about, um, when we speak together about the community of creatures to which we belong, we make attention and so we make place. The kinds of attention we craft in attending to the voices of other creatures, both human and non-human, will be reflected in the possibilities of di for diverse flourishing or for great loss in the places we have been given. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for that and and for engaging with kind of all the senses, um, as it were, um, really focusing on, on that kind of speech and listening um, that might sometimes not be our focus when we're thinking about the soil and, and that sense of touch or taste of the food, but engaging with all those others and, and drawing that into our imagination of thinking about climate justice. Um, if anyone has any questions, do pop them in the chat. And we have just had one. Um, yeah, so um, could you share the name of the two books on place you uh, on place you mentioned toward the beginning of the presentation? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So um, John Inger has um, written a book called um, A Theology of Place, and also Michael Northcutt um, has written a book which uh, was it called um, Place Ecology and the Sacred. Um, which is about um, kind of the sacred as a concept to anchor local ecology. Great, thank you. And do keep any other questions coming in. Um, I don't know if you have if this is if this is part of a part of your thinking. But when you talk about language, um, my mind kind of goes to Pentecost in Babel. I I wondered if you had any reflections in kind of drawing this into kind of the, the theology that's set out in, in Pentecost and how we understand that, how this might influence and, and shape this, this, uh, this idea and be part of this discussion maybe? Yeah, certainly. I think particularly in the ways that we, um, we think about um, language as growing out of um, local ecology so much of the time, um, the language of people groups is, is a product of the, the history and tradition that's rooted in the place that they're from. Um, and so <clears throat> we have a long history um, out of colonialism of um, disrupting those languages, of disrupting people's capacity to speak um, about their own history and um, belonging to local place. And so um, I think we have, a, we have a vision at Pentecost, not of this diversity of speech um, being kind of corrected as it were, but of it being redeemed that actually um, the, the gospel, the good news can be heard in many languages, to many cultures, to many traditions. Um, and I think we can perhaps apply a similar model to the way we think about the significance of protecting language, um, which speaks about place, um, pr protecting the significance of people speaking in local language, in traditional language about the places they belong to. Um, 
it was a really uh, an interesting um, exploration of that theme um, written by um, a woman, I can't remember her first name, um, last name, Nee Doherty, um, who's written a book about, uh, it's, it's called Thin Places, and she's written about her experience of being um, um, someone growing up in Northern Ireland during the Troubles and um, the way that she's reconnected with some of and recovered from some of the trauma of that experience has been through um, learning Irish and learning the place names of the place which had become such a source of trauma for her and connecting, reconnecting to local ecology, which is a beautiful exploration of that. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really helpful kind of reference point for us. So yeah, thank you. I've had a few more questions coming in the chat as well. Um, have you thought about bringing out the nature of wounding in connection to this topic? Yeah, absolutely. I deliberately avoided talking about the ways that Pretian refers to prayer as wound um, in this because it's such a complicated um, part of what he says. And it's difficult to know how much of it is just kind of his like poetic French Catholicism getting away from him and how much it's central to his thinking. Um, so Chrétien describes prayer as a wounding. Um, I think that's a very helpful image in some ways. And certainly my work is around woundedness and um, truth emerging from woundedness. Um, I think there's also some dangers around it, um, in particular, because it, it can begin to sort of um, re-emphasize re this idea that in order to love, you must be wounded, um, that, wo that love requires woundedness. And um, I think without some quite subtle and careful thought around that, that can become quite dangerous. And we certainly had that, um, that's been a very strong thread in Christian ethical tradition, um, in the ways we've, um, you know, the way that we um, imagine language around martyrdom, for example, not to disparage, you know, the, the significance of martyrdom at all in our tradition, but to say that, um, to say that it's it's difficult to know in the in a sort of climate and ecological breakdown trauma context whether limiting love to woundedness is useful. Um, so I'm kind of still playing with that idea a little bit. But thank you for raising that. I mean, it's it's still like on my periphery, and I'm not not yet sure what to do with it. So <clears throat> awesome, thank you. Um, another question here: Have you done any work on the ways multiple names can apply to the same creatures? tying them into different cultures and opening up different kinds of grief. Yeah, so in my talk, I briefly mentioned, um, you know, the, the unintended or the, the, the sort of the ways naming can be abused. Um, so we can think about, someone's mentioned that in a sort of comment that, that naming isn't a sort of mm. always good or even necessarily neutral. And part of what I'm arguing is that it's not neutral, which is why we need to be very attentive to the names that we use. Um, so we have, you know, we've got a long history of, of creatures being categorized through naming as a, as a means of control. Um, and I think, it's a, I think it's a really pertinent point that um, relationship to creatures is very much influenced by the names that we are taught for them and the, the significance of those names for local belonging. So I'm, I'm currently staying with my family who live in Norfolk now. And um, the local name for a ladybird here is a Bishy Barney Bee. And um, there's lots of um, there's lots of you know places in Norfolk which are named or like children's groups that are named after Bishy Barney bees because it it means something to have a local name for this local creature um, and to draw attention to it in that way. So I, I think there's real value in um, in names which emerge out of local tradition um, and the diversity of that of that naming. It's also interesting to think about the ways that in many languages um, other kinds of human experience emerge out of um, kind of experiences of the world around us. So how we how we describe um, the way we might feel in a relationship or um, the ways that uh, different emotions affect us um, in many languages are drawn from the natural world. And we there's long histories of um, the ways that different emotional states, for example, are, are related to creatures in our mythologies or our traditions. Um, so maintaining that kind of consistent relationship is I think important for, for belonging to place and also important to what it means to invite others into the place where we belong. Um, that local ecologies have much longer histories than human culture does in, in, the, place it, in the place that we find ourselves. So when we talk about the local, um, often it's, you know, local culture is often dictated by, um, you know, what has been the culture of the last couple of hundred years. If we think about a local ecology that's thousands of years old, it has a much longer history um, of, of directing belonging. Um, and I think 
some of that can be useful in disrupting assumptions about the kinds of cultural approaches that are required for people to belong to a place, um, rather than focusing on solely on human constructs of what belonging means, looking at the wider world um, to which we can we can each belong um, through some of that kind of attentiveness to names. Sure. Thank you so much, Hannah, for your presentation and also really articulate responses um, to questions and to our audience as well. Thank you for your questions and your participation this afternoon.